Okay. All right, we're ready for Cyber Smart, and we are live, as we all know. Uh, first, Jace, Jacob Strasser is executive chairman of RG, RSG, sorry. Or RSS, you can say either. And, yep, and also as a commander of uh, Navy Secure, Cybersecurity uh, Group as well. Uh, Dee Dee is next. She is uh, many times I've seen her title say Chief Information Security Officer. She's with Philip 66. Thank you so much for being here, Dee Dee, once again. Al Lindrith is a phenomenal CIO, SVP from All Plains America. Can't say enough about you, Al. Thank you for being here. And uh, we had people flying in last night. Preston got in late last night. He is the top security uh, partner uh, worldwide, yeah, or no, North America. Don't do that to me. Yep. <laughs> yep. I need okay. to focus. To they need to focus <laughs> on North America. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you for, for uh, flying in. Uh, Paul Schaus, this gentleman has uh, implemented, what, oh, well over a million devices worldwide. Uh, he's, he's definitely part of the whole movement of IoT and knows everything you can think about uh, with, with moving any type of asset, any type of thing, mobile uh, trucks or anything like that. And then, of course, we have uh, Mr. Jason Duff. If you don't know Jason, he is vice president of uh, Energy Group for IBM, and we are uh, elated to have all of you here this morning. Thank you, and we'll get started right away. Thank you, Jacob. Thanks, sir. So thanks, Tim. Um, what an impressive group you've assembled. Uh, I think the, um, uh, you know, this panel, I believe we can keep this just under two hours. Um, we're going to try our best. We're going we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna to try our best. So, you know, thinking about cybersecurity and, and the topic um, that we're just kind of talking about, cyber smart supply chains and um, third party integrations and, and dealing with uh, the third party in the supply chain. We've heard a lot um, today about the need um, in the industry to enable end to end communications, right? Get through the digital transformation that we're looking um, to bridge. And every day you hear you know, another news outlet come out and basically say the supply chain is under attack, right? I don't think, you know, we can go a day without hearing that, right? And so just yesterday, um, uh, one of the news outlets talked about, you know, um, the, the dark web selling sensitive um, company proprietary data, right? And, and really, what, what, what are they selling? What are they capturing? What are they looking for? And how, why is this so important, right? And why are we here today to discuss this very important topic to the industry, and, and not just to the industry, but as it relates to critical infrastructure, right? And I think this group of people, right, our supply chain is critical to our nation's success and to the economy and to our growth, right, as, as, we, uh, as we press forward. So how, how are these actors, right, how are we getting to the point where, um, uh, you know, we're being attacked at a tremendous rate, right, in our supply chain, and, and, and really, how does it continue to happen? So I just want you guys to think through that, right, that question, and as you're talking to the audience, right, your experiences in the industry, your experiences at the table as a, as a CISO, um, I really want you guys to just kind of help everyone understand, you know, where we are, right, and what are some of the things we can do to bridge those gaps. All right, so Dee Dee, ladies first. I wouldn't be a good naval officer if I, if I didn't, you know, have you go first. So one of the one of the threads we're physically pulling on is digital resilience, right? What does that mean, digital resilience? When you say this to, you know, uh, a CEO, a CFO, um, you know, CFO, all they hear is click, 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 money, 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 going out the register, right? Um, what does digital resilience mean? And then, you know. What is the key element, right, the critical elements of that conversation, right, to safeguard our infrastructures going forward? What, what, what do you think about that? Thank you, Jacob. Uh, for the record, I'm a recovering CISO. My uh, current title is the Chief Digital Security Architect. Yeah, they're looking for a unicorn in a CISO to be technical, to be business, to be everything else, as, as well as a psychologist. 
Anyway, uh, digital resilience. So as we all know that a lot of people talk about technology. Technology is always an IT problem. And then with a few years back, we're all going through the digital transformation. We need to realize that digital is no longer an IT problem. It is everyone's problem. It is a business problem. So what does it mean when we talk about digital resilience? Meaning that you're not putting all the accountability and res uh, responsibilities all on the IT side of it. It is about everyone else at the table who makes the decision, who makes money. That includes um, the back office, what people might say HR, um, uh, even the financial side of it. So going through the different components of the digital resilience is to get everybody on the same table at the same table talking that this is everyone's issue including especially we are in the global supply chain conference supply global supply chain it is the landing zone it is the runway for attackers to actually come through your organization it doesn't matter what your organization is small big public private those are the people that we need to be at the same table talking about the same thing it including is the people side the process and the technology we tend to think that technology would solve everything including technology now i heard on npr uh, that humu now is going to uh, help resolve problem with the great resignation actually i'm very curious and intrigued about that but anyway i'm always thinking about okay what are they going to do with the data how is the cyber protection is going to take place in that um, application. Anyway, so I digress on that one. But typical, when you talk to your leader, start talking about not focusing on the internal only. We're moving into, which is the, the, the term has been coined for in, since in the 90s, the zero trust. You don't trust anyone, you verify, you trust and verify. Because many times the business start making decision partnering with a third party, especially mostly in the cloud now, with the 100% um, trusting say, oh yeah, they're a big company. I'm sure their cybersecurity posture is not questionable. Who are we to go through a third party assessment with them? Yet the attack normally, the, the attackers now know that, hey, why do we focus our energy attacking the main castle while we can attack the supply chains who come in and off your network. So that's one area that we need to focus on. And um, with the zero trust concept, people always think is that, okay, the security team, we have the robot security team, we have all the technology, we have the next generation firewalls. They were still thinking in the firewall as a parameter. Now we coexist on-prem, cloud, third party, those parameters are becoming blurry. Your identity, your employee, your contractor, any person who is authorized to use something in your system is your new parameter. So focusing, protecting the data through the lens of the people, especially when Jacob was mentioning the supply chain attack is usually stealing the credentials because once you steal the credentials, you become that person, you impersonate, well, not you, the bad actors become an authorized person and they can move laterally inside the organization. So, so that's another component that we need to think about. And another one is that, I'm only gonna talk about these three points, is right now the CISO, hence I'm a recovering CISO, in, especially I'm gonna talk about just in the oil and gas companies. Business don't know where to put CISO. CISO roles have just emerged within 10, 15 years ago. So they don't know where to put that CISO. They don't know how to make that language, trans translating that into the business. So it's like, okay, CISO should report to CIOs. Guess what? It's a competing interest. Because the CIO, Jacob and I were talking about, the, the role is the enabler for business, business so that they can move forward. If the CISO is under the CIO, that competing interest that, and many, many attacks actually is using systems that have not been patched for a while. It's not, there's, there's zero day vulnerability, but many times the attacker is going to attack, do the low hanging fruit, 
common system that have not been patched because um, either a budget issue, personal issue, and whatsoever. So that competing priorities where the CISO will say, we need to patch these systems. The others say, oh, we don't have the budget to do that, or we don't have the personnel to do that, or we cannot impact operations. So those are the three areas, at least mainly in my personal perspective on the cyber resilience. You're talking about uh, the people being your new parameter. You're talking about a third party supply chain also should be part of your um, business discussion in the cyber security posture. And then the position of CISO is no longer a, an IT issue. It is a business issue. Thank you. Thank you, Didi. So you, you touched on, um, you know, basically designing security strategies and executing those throughout, right, with identity being a key component. Um, Al, I'd, I'd be interested from you, right, just in the industry today, right, oil and gas pipeline, right, um, what are you seeing and, and what are your thoughts on this topic? Thank you. Uh, so like Didi said, the attackers are focusing on the entire supply chain, trying to find the weakest uh, area of it, whether it's software, hardware, misconfigurations, vulnerabilities, uh, access control, you know, stolen credentials that they can leverage. Um, and so you're, you're going to have a greater likelihood of attack on the IT networks just because their proximity to the internet, but the real uh, crown jewels for the attackers in terms of impact is more on the operational technology side. Uh, so, you know, there you can have, you can cause operational disruptions, you can create real health, safety, environmental issues uh, for, uh, you know, whether it's nation states that are just trying to position to say as a deterrent, hey, if we wanted to pull the trigger, we could, and that's happened, particularly in utilities where we found that presence. Uh, and, and when you've got an example like the Ukraine, where the you know it's part of a military strategy, or where that actually is happening, you can see what the potential of just the motivation being there could be, because the presence was there, but maybe the motivation wasn't at that point to actually be deliberate and committed and pull that trigger. Uh, or you know you've got uh, ransomware, ransomware as a service, you know criminal enterprises that really really have some of the same resources. As, as these you know, nation states with unlimited resources now, or they have the, the same tools, uh, and they're going after 24 by seven uh, operations, which is really what you're gonna find in the OT side. So, you know, if you look a couple of years ago, the OT side in the US, you really didn't have a lot of uh, documented safety issues and incidents, and you see how far along it's come in the last two years with the colonial incident, uh, you know, with supply chain, sophisticated attacks like solar winds, uh, where you've got, a, you know, it's coming through as a certified release from the owner of that software, you know, how do you protect against that? But you just imagine where it's gonna be in two, in two years, you know? So uh, at the same time, OT is tougher to get into uh, to create maximum impact. Uh, so you have, it's naturally a little more defensible, it sits behind firewalls, it's, it's farther away from the business networks and the internet, but you've got this real push for data uh, from the operation side, you know, automation to manage or remote access to, to manage the assets better. Uh, that's just happening, you know, with the disruptive world we live in where everybody's trying to preserve their margins. That's creating this convergence on the OT side. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's more of, a, of an attack vector, it's more of a target, uh, and, and it's, you know, those natural defenses, which really caused it to not have the right cyber measures, controls in place to begin with, are fading away. So it's a little bit of where IT was 15, 20 years ago, where there was so much of a, of an, of a attention around the perimeter controls. And then what really started happening on the IT business networks is companies, the, the attacks got better, start getting in, companies realize it's a matter of when, not if, and so now we need to really have the right detective controls uh, and responsive procedures and controls and capabilities, and now it's really moved over into predictive, trying to get ahead of it through like threat intel, the ISAC, thing, things like that. Uh, and OT really hasn't gotten there. The tools aren't that great. Uh, to be able to detect when an attack happens, a lot of it is off network. 
uh, and, and so it makes it even more difficult. So it's tougher for the attackers, tougher for the defenders and the operators. Uh, and, and, you know, and then you really get into, when you talk supply chain uh, risk, you, you know, the operators really need to work with the vendors. Um, and the, the vendors can be the software companies, they can be uh, the consulting firms, you know, that are working with it or that need access. And there you've got this conflict between, uh, you've got a lot of companies that are not standardizing their equipment, they're using multi-generational older uh, systems. The, the vendors, the ones who are focusing more on cyber measures at this point are maybe focusing one or two versions behind, certainly not any farther past that. So it's very difficult for companies to absorb on a widespread basis uh, any patches or new releases that would address cybersecurity requirements just because they're not as standardized and, and they have older equipment. Uh, table stakes should be that companies should expect uh, independent assurances and audits from these vendors. And like Didi mentioned, it's not out there in, in a lot of cases that you'd expect. Uh, those should be hard coded into the contracts. They should not be just over the infrastructure, like sometimes you see on like SOC 2 type 2 reports, but really a good hard uh, look at the procedures that exist uh, that, you know, and, and now it goes all the way into the software development. Like if you look at solar ones, you know, if you think for the ha where this could go, I mean, you could see companies having to have a significant amount of resources just to check valid patches that are coming in. Uh, you know, you could see uh, if there's a if there's a hit because, you know, the, there should be a liability on the software vendor that's very clear uh, to, you know, compensate for the damages of a cyber attack. You know, we're not there. We're not we're not there with any of this. Uh, but the implications are, pr are pretty huge. Um, and there's just a need to get the table stakes right, both on the contracts and the procurement processes, where, which is where you guys come in. Because uh, a lot of times I will tell you with supply chain organizations, they're kind of going after the cheap alternative. Uh, and if there's not the right governance in place, then you're kind of playing catch up a little bit with the business of expectations have already been created uh, on, on, you know, a, a vendor that, it was maybe a cloud small business essentially and maybe hasn't made the right investment or it doesn't have all the certifications needed for your security team to really get comfortable that your data is going to be protected and you'd be amazed at some of the areas that this falls into with some of these businesses that actually manage sensitive data that's their business and they're lawyering up and they won't even let you get in there and assess what certifications they have uh because maybe because they've been hit it, you know, I mean, it's 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 really it gets a little bit crazy. Uh, so, you know, starts with the suppliers and operators uh, within companies. It's really important that OT and IT come together and are working together because sometimes if that's not happening, that can really make everything ten times worse. Uh, especially with trying to integrate uh, the two sides in a way where you can get the data in a controlled, measured fashion. Uh, but also control the access and control the, any updates. And, and probably one of the biggest worries of, of companies that are out there is what's happening in the field. You, you know, I mean, that's a breadth issue. You've got a lot of contractors uh, in different areas. Companies don't have the resources to hit all this. They have to prioritize. It has to be outcome-based. Uh, one of the recommendations we've been making a lot is call it what's called, we call it the cyber PHA, which is kind of a, you know, you've got these safety programs that have been set up by companies. Well, go ahead, have that be uh, use uh, credible and known cyber threats, inject use threat intel, build it within the existing programs, and then you're more outcome based. And that's a little different from trying to go out there and map and document all your network segment, everything. At least then you can start with the biggest impact. And, and get, you know, kind of orient around that, orient, prioritize your activities around that and critical infrastructure, which is sometimes a little tough to define. Uh, make certain that your resources are allocated around those things rather than a bottom-up prescriptive, we're, we're going to, you know, attack everything type thing, which I always tell our auditors and our internal auditors, if you think about managing risks, like a bunch of bar charts moving around, what happens if I try to get this one bar down to zero practically? while well, the other ones go up because you've got finite resources, attention, people, and you have to prioritize. Sometimes that means you have to wear a little bit of risk. 
so it's uh, the supply chain problem is a big one. It's very, very complicated. It starts with kind of low hanging fruit, like understanding identity, understanding access, having solid contracts, making certain you're making smart decisions that supply chains coordinated with your cyber groups uh, to make certain that controls are in place and it's not just cost focused. But then, I mean, you take it to the logical conclusion of what's happening with valid software patches and where the attackers are trying to focus across the entire supply chain. Um, and it gets incredibly complicated. You know? So I look forward to hearing what everybody else's thoughts and what some of the questions are today. No, fantastic, thank you so much. Um, so I'm gonna keep pulling on that thread with um, with OT and, and some of the technologies in the reporting, um, you know, you, you, you highlight two things from a contractual perspective, right? I mean, we don't think about that enough in IT, right? And, and literally with OLAs, right, and SLAs, and things that we do just to kind of KPIs that we all track, right, that we do internally just kind of stay in course, um, that's great, right? But if I can't hold my vendor, my third party accountable, or if you look at some of the other surveys that just recently came out, 31% of, of supply chain companies don't even know their vendors' cybersecurity posture, right? At Thirty-one percent, right? So that conversation, Al, I think you you hit a key, right? It's it has to happen at the business level. Jason, what, what would you say um, uh, from the industry perspective um, that you are seeing, right, at that level, talking about some of those things? So I, yeah, I think it goes back. We're all. I'm definitely not a spring chicken, and I used to be a uh, been out for. 30 odd years, sort of probably mostly in upstream JVs. And I think actually, if you tell the story from that side, what was security really about the last 20, 30 years ago? It was a user profile. It was usually a finance or a supply chain system. And can Jason have access? Can he not have access? And I think that's what we've all grown up with, at least I think looking around the room, 40s, 50s, or something. Apologies for any 30 somethings. I'll be getting more next. I'm Scottish. Though. Um, by the way, beautiful day to day. It's not uh, very like St. Andrew's outside <laughs> on a July <laughs> on one day during summer. It's a great event to plan. Um, but I think that's where our, it stems from. I think we, as a, our, the junior people that are coming through now in the next generation will probably get this better. I think for us, security for me initially, I'm just thinking, DD, of what you said now. I think we grew up with you could implement a system. Can, you know, can Jason have access, can he not? And then it's evolved. And then if you think now, look at, I mean, I'll take your business. So let's talk business. Al's business, Plains All American, just um, agreed a joint venture with Oryx and Penny. That's a JV that's gonna supply end-to-end -end gas and um, LNG from the Permian in Canada, strip up the Permian, sorry, straight out into the terminals and then tracking on, again, potentially some blockchain. These things are happening every day to us. Digital means not IT, go back to DD's point. I think it means us changing the game and the business demanding we need to do something different. And it's not an IT issue. It's the business demanding to stay alive. We need to do an end to end. I think um, the, the first panel that I was, uh, was listening to, it was exactly what was happening. How do we then sort this out? And then you've got so much outside influences as you said and then do it the thing that we are trying to do along with the other um hyperscalers i think in terms of if you think of cloud i think we're all trying to look at how do you standardize how do we get away from and go back to one of your points al how do we go away from tim doing something al doing something Preston doing something and jason and not trusting each other i think in the few years of jason's view my view is i think we will end up having to at least check in and almost getting a health check that says bang, put it on there, do it, that's the way we're working it. And whether you use Amazon, IBM, AWS, it's the same process, you're secure, check in the box, a little bit like the vaccinations just now, would be another thing I should talk about, there you go. <laughs> but literally a way of actually, have you got it, have you not, can you be trusted? And that would be, if you, if you take the layman's terms away from it, that's a problem. Everyone still looks at IT and says, Al, CIO, what the hell's going on? And it's not. The business is demanding that we change and put end to end. The business demands now I need to have an interface with you, Tim, yeah. or <clears throat> there's a joint venture which opens up these issues. So I think as we get more into 
packages of work, ways of working, we can do it. Go back to another thing you said, Al, I think you're absolutely right. We have to, as a business, as, yeah, we need to trust each other and put it into the contracts. Just now it's almost something that we don't want to do and you guys don't want to do because there's so many, is it your fault, my fault, and it's always written on a, you know, hey, um, you know, there's too much liability there. We, we do need to find some way of doing this and doing it smartly and holding each other to accountable, accountability and setting up and understand what we're going to do. I think the final thing from an oil and gas perspective, I look after oil and gas North America. I think we do need to do a lot more. Um, David and I, David's still around, but we were on a panel the other day. We need to learn a lot more from the other industries, insurance, banking. This has been hit, you know, this is, these guys are way, way ahead of us. We're generally laggards in oil and gas. And I think we do need to look at, or if you look at an industry's perspective, perspective we can be smart, pick up some of these people, or pick up the lessons learned, pick some of these people up, clean up the dirty oil. That, that's a problem just now and again, something that came up with the panel one today. How can we attract the Jerry's, the Tim's, the Preston's of the future? We have to show a few, at least take a, a, a jump and get the leverage from the other industries. Show a very clean energy going forward. We need to still do some work and then attract the right people back. If we do not try attract them, we'll have a gap, we'll have a big problem and there'll be I'll still have a job when I'm 70 odds, but probably don't want a job. Although if you ask my wife, she probably does want me to have a job. Um, but we will need to get to a point of how do we attract the people that are probably finding banking, insurance, insurance distribution, etc., a lot more exciting than that industry. There's a lot of things there. Sorry, that was but I think it's getting back to how do we get things into a standard set way without getting in the technical way that we can all trust and some trust verification back. You know, Preston's got it, I can trust them, we can do it, we can sign up, we can go. Preston, do you want to? Yeah, so so I want to pull on you you made you made two two comments that I want to pull on, right? And one of them is you talk about identity as a person, right? He was saying OT is huge, right? So is IoT today in this industry. So I want to I want to push to um, uh, to Preston um, real quick and, and basically um, Paul. And I want them to just kind of chat a little bit about identity access management for devices yeah. uh, where we're at, right? Because every one of you have highlighted, right? There is a human factor to this, right? Identity access management is critical. It's key. Auditing is another piece. So um, Preston, go ahead and, and just kind of, you know, from your perspective, right? How do we protect this the edge network, right? Dee talked about we're no longer behind a perimeter. Right, we're no longer contained. Right. Right. So let's chat about that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, technically, there really is no edge anymore. Right. You know, it, it's this nebulous thing that that uh, continues to disappear farther and farther into the the virtual ether. Right. Which is for those that were in the room this morning talking about the panel for the agility for situations we've been through in the last eighteen months, where all of a sudden you sent ten thousand people to go work virtually, and you were able to actually do that. Um, whereas five years ago, my guess is most of you probably couldn't have pulled that off, right? Um, all of this disappearing edge is what gives us the ability to have that kind of change in our business and not completely collapse under the pressure uh, that exists. But it puts a significant amount of pressure and stress on the infrastructure required to deliver that for you, right? Whether that's the applications that are sitting on the cloud environments hosted by a third party, you're running them yourselves, the technology is required to give people that access to know who they are, what are they allowed to access. And by the way, all of these technologies are changing very rapidly underneath us as we speak. Um, and I realize this is not an IT audience, but for most of you, your companies have gone through in the last five years or are going through a significant change in the way they handle managing you as an individual from an identity perspective to get to make the take all the friction out of the system when you want to access this application and go to this one, to this one, to this one, to this one. Because what happens is you make phone calls going, I got into this, but I can't get into this. And they generate a ticket. And somebody has to go work that ticket and it drives cost and everything creates more people, right? So taking the friction out creates a significant amount of stress in the system to allow you to work this way, which is what brings the cost down, which is what drives the automation, all the things that you know, we all like to put in these neat little buckets, but they all fit together very, very closely 
um, when it comes to creating an enterprise that's agile in a way that lets our businesses change and grow at the pace that we want. Now, what that does from a security perspective is say, now I have to be able to put the controls in place that don't restrict that and create more friction as you're trying to remove the friction associated with the whole process for the end user, whether it's you as, a, as an employee, your customers, your third party partners, the people that you provide access to the systems, again, to make it more agile and more automated to do business with you as an enterprise, right? So all of these things create a, a significant amount. And I'll, I'll let Paul talk in a minute about um, how we do, how this gets done in a device perspective and, and what the implications are. But I, I wanna get a point across that I think most of you may not really understand is the level of sophistication that is going into the threat actor's ability to attack your enterprise today is unbelievably off the charts. We talk about AI and ML and all these really fancy technologies. Let me just tell you, they are using them against us as much as we are using them to protect ourselves and to automate our businesses. So yeah, at warp speed. Absolutely, at, at warp tremendous warp, warp speed. Warp. And, and they are highly sophisticated money-making enterprises. These are not random kids sitting in their basements banging away on their home computers anymore. These are very sophisticated, very organized. They run them like businesses. So they choose their targets very carefully, right? So the reason supply chain attacks have become popular is I can attack one place and I can get access to thousands of others without having to go to those thousands of others and attack them individually. So that level of sophistication is, is new-ish within the last kind of five to seven years within the business. The technology is driving their ability to automate their process, just like we're automating our processes uh, to defend them and to run our businesses. So there's a lot of sophistication here that I think is not really well known to the general public who doesn't live in the IT and security world like uh, many of us do on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'll give you a really good example. I just shared this um, with a few of the group a couple of minutes ago. The sophistication has gotten to a place where Social engineering has always been a very important part of the threat actor and hacking you know, enterprise, if you will, but it's really become a more um, creative process than it ever was before. So as we provide more mobile access to employees, to third-party partners, to interact with these applications, we're servicing more data, uh, more information up to them for them to be able to do things. I saw an example of an attack the other day, for the first time I'd seen it, where they're serving an image on a mobile phone, and that image has a hair embedded in it. So when you look at the screen, it looks like there's a hair on your screen. So what is the first thing that you do? You take your finger and you go, and you swipe the hair away, right? Well, as soon as you swipe that screen, you're gesturing on the screen and in the background of that image, they've embedded a link that automatically activates that you don't see as soon as you make that swipe to get rid of that hair and downloads a program onto your phone and gives them access to the things that they want to see. Right? So this is the kind of sophistication we're starting to deal with. So first advice is if you get a hair on your screen, blow it off. <laughs> <laughs> so just a friendly, friendly piece of advice from one security professional to, uh, to others. But it's just an example of the kind of thing and the creativity that a real criminal enterprise is driving that's doing this for money. It's not for fun. And Al's right, there are instances where nation states are absolutely after disruption, access. They want to steal intellectual property in some cases, but it is a criminal enterprise to make money, right? Just like the rest of us, we're just not criminals. We want to make money. They're looking for the fastest, easiest way to do that, right? So keep that in mind. Yeah, great point. So, so Paul, um, really shifting back to OT and IoT, um, I know from a device authority perspective, um, you know, we're kind of vulnerable out there, right? As it relates to all the Internet of Things that are just popping up on the networks and. And, um, and we really don't have an identity for those mobile devices. So what's some thoughts to protect those devices going forward? Sure. Yes. So as, uh, as you mentioned earlier, I've personally been involved with the deployment of over, coming up on probably 2 million devices, IoT devices. Um, a dinosaur uh, before IoT was actually called MDM. Um, some of you may have heard of that. <laughs> and I'm going all the way back to the, the uh, AMPS analog cellular network before the 1G. <laughs> so I'm OG. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> what's what's interesting is, is you know, I, I was so immersed in that industry for so long in you know, 33 years of technology and, and for the longest time never myself really understood the devices I was putting out there 
were putting us at risk. And so it came home to me about two years ago that this is my own family I have to worry about, right? Literally, this becomes personal because what if something happens to our water system? What if something happens to you know a colonial pipeline that's worse than just a ransom? What if it's an explosion? This is serious. This, this couldn't be any more serious than it is. And so the, the only answer when we talk about rooted trust is, well, first of all, the industry has started to figure out at a manufacturing level, I can put a bootstrap, uh, which is a password essentially, so just to kind of keep it easy for everybody. So that when that device is sent from the manufacturer to the wholesale, to distribution, to the retailer that eventually sells it to you for your SCADA system or for whatever you know, devices that are gonna get installed out there in the OT world. So now it's gonna light up, it's, it's gonna get turned on and we essentially trust that that password that was you know, shipped when it was manufactured is, is all good. And that's the last thing that we do to authenticate that device for its life cycle. How, how many devices do you guys think that you have out there right now today that are more than five years old? My show of hands. More than 10 years old? More than 20 years old. There's stuff that's out there still right now that has been out there for 20 years. Do you think that you can trust that device? I would. And, and so then the other challenge becomes is it's, um, we have what's called greenfield and brownfield. Greenfield being new deployments, so I'm deploying new devices. Brownfield are my existing devices are just talking about. There's challenges around how do I, how do I update that device um, so that it can you know, be you know, guarded against you know, those threats. And the fact is, is there's, there's some stuff out there that's just, you can't. Uh, from a software and from a hardware physical processing power that is capable of doing, um, the device simply needs to be replaced. That's that's the harsh reality. So now I got a budget problem, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It may be a given problem. Yeah. And and oh my gosh, think of the amount of workforce necessary to go out site to site to do that type of labor. <clears throat> So, so the whole trick here is when we talk about you know, identity access management is really around um, deploying a technology that does have the ability to do greenfield and brownfield. And so who is familiar with two-factor two authentication? Everybody use two-factor? So we got that we, you know, we, because there's a human involvement. Now I got a device that there's no human. How do I two-factor authenticate? So there's technology out there today that has the ability, it's a software, you know, piece of you know, software that goes on a device, but it doesn't just go on the device. It goes on your network as well. Uh, because I, 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 can, I think now you mentioned it earlier is software updates. So now I've got a device that I've got the ability to know that you know, it's truly who it should be. And, you know, and I'm keeping tabs on that. But what about the device knowing that I should trust that? Al sending me a software update. How am I intelligent enough as a device to know that I should say, yeah, oh, it's out. Hey, Al, I'm taking your software. Guess what? Hackers have figured out how to become out. Scary, huh? Yeah. So now, guess what I now have is once I've captured that device, I'm now attached to your network and I got you. This is what's happened more often than ever gets reported because these are dirty little secrets that the industry does not like to disclose and if it can keep from being a CNN event, it's going to, right? None of us want to be you know, the CEO of Colonial Pipeline, you know, having to go through you know, something like that. So, so, so there's the whole life cycle management. So the, the, here's the other piece. There are a lot of devices that come back because they fail in the field or um, they need updates or, you know, there's things that just physically I have to, you know, take this device and, and bring it back in. So does it just go in the trash can or does it get redeployed? So again, who, how many people are going to touch that device that you could have an internal threat of a bad actor um, with a thumb drive that's capable of being able to plug into that, you know, Moxa device that's uh, sitting there on your, you know, awesome, you know, PLU. Right, that, that, that's managing your whole SCADA network. 
And so I didn't even realize it, that you know this engineer just just got me and because he got paid a lot of money. Now let's take the next thing. We're using all kinds of hardware devices that are guess where they're manufactured. It's already been mentioned today. It's in Shenzhen, you know, it's uh, it's in Thailand, it's all over the world in places where you know we should see them as an absolute threat. Um, I was with a group working last week uh, as a consultant for uh, for a drone company that's uh, doing you know flyovers. I'm sure there's a lot of people in the room that use drones today. Um, highly unsecured environment. Um, they're actually doing Wi-Fi, pulling data down as they're flying. Um, they found that they had personal WPK2 same security passwords. What's your home you know, wireless network? Default. Yeah, as a default, and they never changed it. And then there's no certificate rotations going on. So okay. auditing, auditing becomes a huge element. Auditing is an absolute, yeah, right. no, no question. And and the last thing I would say is, um, you know, the distributed you know, distributed workforce. Do you know that? How many of you have an Alexa or a Google in your house? Right? And we know they listen, right? Um, that's just one device of so many IoT devices that um, are in our homes today. Smart bulbs, um, my garage door is smart. I know you know, to get, leave it up or down, right? Um, those are entry points. So we've literally opened to your your, your point, we've opened our world up where there is no edge any longer. So you better have you know, on board technology to protect it. No, that's that's fantastic. Great points. Um, you know, I know we got an hour left, um, <laughs> and we just keep talking up here. That's the problem with techies. We can talk and talk. Um, but Tim, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask. Do you want to open up to some questions okay. from the floor before we we close the panel? I I, I do I do want to mention no, something. Go ahead. Go ahead. We seem very dark, but we're not. <laughs> yeah, we're, uh, we're never looking for the bright spot. Is that, is that what you're saying? You know, so, you know the only one just to add to this. Yeah, I'm just thinking about the points. I'm just thinking the audience as well and ourselves. You know what happens? And Tress, you and I have this problem. When the client asks us as IBM or anyone outside, you want to. I have a problem that security, and you know what I'm going to say, is always additional. Seriously, I remember I'm sitting on the other side and when we're looking at something and saying, hey, I'm going to have some product. It's your story that I was just thinking about. Preston and I's challenge, and again, it goes back to it's new and security should be at the front. But the clients, ah, I might take them from you. We're saying, hold on, how the hell are you going to do this end to end? Have you really got the skills? That's the challenge for us because if we fall into ah, security, Preston will just do additional. That's the start of it because okay, we're still to deal with the expectations back into to your point. Now, okay, you guys take us. We need to bring it up front and says, guys, if we're going to do this digital, security has to be an element of it, and then you get people from the start. From the start, I was just thinking of your story. That's our biggest challenge, I think, and not make it additional. Says it has to be specifically in it's built in, right? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, one of the things uh, on the first panel that we didn't mention that uh, John Singleton, we're actually doing a project with him with 50 different manufacturers and retailers, and we're starting at the dock of the manufacturer releasing the goods in China, Indonesia, Cambodia, wherever. Yep, we're on a great platform, but that is going to be our forefront worry, and we are using AI and predictive analytics on the front end of that because the whole problem is the port shuts down. What's he do? The next thing you know, he, he was doing 100 containers, which is a lot. I mean, that, that's a lot of movement to put on aircraft, right? So, you know, without getting into a name, let's say it wasn't Walmart, but it was almost that size, <laughs> automatically says, I need 15 aircrafts. Yeah, the import was just shut down, move it now. Whatever the price, just don't bury me in the cost, right? And then you hear him say today, you got to have that stuff, and they're paying two and a half million dollars for one darn aircraft. Yeah, right. Nobody's sitting there going, "What about the security?" Yeah, get it here. I got to recognize my revenue business. Don't yeah. care. Yeah. Right. So, you got a question over here? Yeah, I just I don't think it's that they don't care about it. I think that they're so busy in their own days and their own problems, and they don't have 
your knowledge and your expertise right. to be able to even fathom thinking, or you guys are staying up at night over this. <coughs> They're, they have it as an expectation. As a business. If yeah. I have a phone, if I have a computer, I expect it's going to be a safe one. Mm -hmm. and, and we come from such a heavy industry about safety that it is an expectation. And so I think it comes down to a communication issue more than really, don't you care. know, they don't care. Yeah, yeah you know, the, uh, the, the parallel to safety is a really interesting one and comes up a lot. Uh, so in safety, like if you think about the risk equation in safety, uh, and you're right, it is hard coded into our company's DNA, especially in oil and gas. Uh, you know, the probability side of it versus the severity side or magnitude often has to do with like material or design deficiencies. You know, I mean, there's obviously the human element, but a lot of it's tied to training and repeatability and you know, stop work type things and and uh, if you look at cyber and the probability side is really about opportunity and motivation and it's much more complicated and much more dynamic and uh, you know that just when you look at safety I was part of a study a couple of years ago when we hadn't really had a lot of incidents uh, from a safety perspective that were cyber induced like we have now especially around OT uh, you know, what you saw, though, is you saw a lot of near misses, you know, if you want to put it in safety terms. There was a lot, and it was very difficult to look at the metrics and know that, too, because a lot of them weren't captured at that time. You know, now that's how safety has evolved. There's this big focus on near misses and lessons learned, and that's how we all get better within our companies at safety. That's difficult to do with cyber. Uh, with the state of, uh, you know, reporting, and, and that's being worked on both at a government and the, and the industry level, and the oil and gas ISACs are really important to that, I think. Uh, but until that gets better and we get to that lessons learned evolution, uh, yeah, that's where we got to get to with cyber like we have with, with safety. And, and I would say just real quick, uh, <laughs> Cyber has been, from an IT-driven perspective, all about detection and reaction. It, and, and that's tough for a lot of people to hear, but it's true. Instead of full, full prevention, so you know, the old adage, offense, the best offense is much better than you know, me defense. You, you need to be on your toes rather than on your heels. And to your point, take a survey. How many people here use single sign-on only at work? Yeah. Everybody uses two-factor authentication. That's good on everything. That's good. Well, yeah. I mean, most people should. All right, we're running out of time. Yeah. I want to be. I want to be good to the to the audience. We're running out of time. We'll turn it back over. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Time for awards. I know everybody hates this. <laughs> Well, Paul, that was uh, that was really good. Digital Identity and Access Management Leader of the Year can be more appropriate. <laughs> now, Preston, I apologize. You're going to have to share this with Jason. Fair Digital enough. Energy Transformation Executive of the Year. He, he's Perfect. better Who gets to yeah. take it home? <laughs> <laughs> Preston, I have to take it home. Oh, I can't say enough to very grateful that you're here today Thanks. and um, you are CIO of the year for global supply chain. Thank you. Now if you didn't know DD, I'm going to say one more thing about her. She is one of the most giving people I know. She'll help anybody out. You'll see her at a lot of uh, different events trying to help people out with cybersecurity. But she also is a big giver back and I'm so grateful that you're here again. And uh, Cybersecurity Leader of the Year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I'm proud to get you one as well. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>